All right, good morning everybody. My name is James Zellner and uh, today we're going to be taking an inside look at USP-71 sterility testing. First, I need to disclose that I have no conflict of interest, real or apparent, financial interest in any company, product or service mentioned in this program, and that includes grants, employment, gifts, stock holdings, and honoraria. Also, this session is accredited by ACPE and is worth one contact hour. Our objectives today at the conclusion of the program should be able to examine USP-71 method suitability and test sample requirements, evaluate the different sample types and their response to sterility testing, interpret certificates of analysis, and identify current regulatory landscapes and issues in uh, alternative sterility test methods. One important point uh, for everything we discussed today in the presentation, the USP routinely publishes updates to the compendia and uh, this presentation covers the current version, uh, but to be sure that uh, whatever you're trying to decide on or, or work on for your pharmacy, you are using the current version. All right, first, what does USP-797 sterile compounding say about USP-71? First, USP-797 gives us the criteria of when we need to conduct a USP-71 sterility test. That includes a high risk level CSP CSPs prepared in groups of more than 25, multiple dose vials, and those products, uh, depending on their exposure time and the temperature they're stored at before sterilization, uh, needs to be taken into account whether they need a 71 sterility test. Those CSPs of less than 25 articles that are high risk and they, that don't fit into any of the other categories do not need a USP 71 sterility test. Also, an important point is that uh, you should check with your individual state board to make sure that it ha doesn't have more stringent requirements for sterility testing versus the USP standards. Uh, this is another qualification table as far as 1A passing sterility test. Uh, it's the limit to storage period before administration without a passing sterility test. Uh, risk levels of low, medium, and high and their definitions can be found in USP 797. Uh, their storage conditions and temperatures there will also let you know when uh, a sterility test must be administered. Uh, also in USP 797, it does make mention of the validation of alternative microbiological methods. That's chapter USP 1223. Uh, later on when we talk about uh, alternative methods, uh, more specifically the rapid sterility methods, uh, that's the framework that they're operating under currently. So what does a USP sterility test actually tell you? First, USP sterility testing does not ensure a batch or lot is sterile. Uh, directly from the USP, they do take into account that uh, the USP outlines what products are required to be sterile. Uh, at the same time, it does make note that a passing sterility test result only indicates that the sample that was tested is sterile under the conditions of the test. Uh, to ensure your batches and lots are sterile, uh, it's pro all about process control, validated sterilization procedure, and aseptic processing must be followed. Uh, having said all that, uh, there are limits to uh, destructive sterility tests as far as what's practical to test and not test, so USP 71 compendial testing is the best we have currently. Uh, USP-71 should be thought of as a process control evaluation and a general indicator of the microbiological quality of the product. It's important that every time it is required by USP-797 based on the product that's uh, being compounded, the sterility test is being performed. And if you're interested, uh, you can always perform a USP-71 sterility test uh, outside of those required by 797 uh, for an indication of product control. Uh, this is an interesting table. Uh, what are the chances that a uh, USP-71 sterility test will catch a contaminated sample? Uh, keep in mind, if only a few articles are contaminated, uh, based on the number of articles tested in the sterility test, it's unlikely that the, uh, the sterility test will detect them, uh, and that's based on statistical limitations. Uh, just covering the table briefly here, uh, if your contamin the contamination rate of units in a batch is across the first row there, and the probability of passing the sterility test is there in the second row. So if we're looking at a 1% contamination rate, uh, the probability is 0.82 that that will still be a passing sterility test. Uh, and for example, moving up to 5%, uh, we still find a not, not a zero number there as far as whether or not the sample will pass the sterility test. 
So this really stresses why uh, the process controls are the most important thing to keep in mind. All right, the sterility testing environment. Uh, you want to make sure the, that the area the samples are going to be tested in is uh, purpose-built, uh, and the idea being to minimize the possibility of contamination from the test. At the same time, whatever the test facility does to prevent, uh, to do the testing, you also can't prevent the detection of microorganisms in the sample. Um, the test area should be stable, should be easily monitored, um, and have controlled conditions conducive to aseptic processing. So that's going to include your environmental monitoring, uh, room pressure control, temperature, uh, all these things go into creating a stable sterility testing environment. Um, and also sterility testing should always be performed by a trained uh, and qualified technician. Uh, the growth media, growth promotion, and the test organisms used in USP-71 sterility testing. For USP-71 sterility testing, there are two medias required. Fluid thioglycolate media, often referred to as FTM or FTG, uh, detects aerobic and anaerobic bacteria. Uh, anaerobic being uh, will not grow in the presence of oxygen. This is very important. There are thousands of species of bacteria out there that will not grow in the presence of oxygen and the FTG medium should detect them. Uh, the other required media is soybean casein digest, uh, referred to as TSB. It detects aerobic bacteria as well and also will, uh, will grow uh, fungal organisms if present in a sample. Growth promotion is required by USP-71. Uh, the reason that it's there is for a valid sterility test. You must prove that the media you're using will grow bacteria and fungi. Uh, growth promotion is not a test on a drug product, but a test on the media to be used in the test. Each lot or batch of media must have a growth promotion performed. Uh, in short, the media is spiked with a small amount of organisms, given a short incubation period, and at the end of that incubation period, you should have uh, representative and easily visible growth of those organisms that you added to the media. This is a a table of the six USP-71 organisms that are used in both growth promotion and uh, method suitability, which we'll cover shortly. Uh, they act as representative organisms for their various groups. Uh, there are four bacterial organisms, two fungal organisms. You can see in the properties column there, uh, it covers gram-positive rods and cocci. Uh, spore formers, gram-negative organisms are represented. Budding yeast and molds are also represented. Uh, their oxygen requirements, you'll notice the Clostridium sporogenes there is an anaerobic organism, so it's going to illustrate that the FTG medium used will recover anaerobic organisms. All right, the methods actually used for sterility tests and their method suitability. There are two methods used for USP-71 compendial sterility testing. The first one is a membrane filtration method. This is the preferred method, as it's easy to test large volumes, and uh, especially with closed systems, there's a low risk of con contamination during the test. Briefly, the sample is passed through a set of filters. The filters are then rinsed with a USP-71 approved rinse fluid, and the filters are then placed in contact with the growth media and incubated. The other option is a direct inoculation method, whereby the sample is put directly into growth media and then incubated. This one is useful for testing non-filterable products. Oils and suspensions uh, or solids would fall into this category. Uh, during sterility testing, we're also given the ability by USP-71 to add emulsifying, neutralizing, or inactivating agents, uh, as long as we can prove that they do not affect the recovery of microorganisms. Uh, a good example of this is beta-lactamase will deactivate penicillin-type antibiotics to allow the testing of those drugs. Uh, briefly talk about membrane filtration methodology here. Uh, there are three diluting and rinsing fluids uh, stated in USP-71. Um, also, since this is a filtration method, there are filters available of different kinds with different binding properties. Um, so between the rinse fluid options and the filter options, we get a specific combination, uh, and in some, ca some cases it can involve multiple rinse fluids of, uh, of actions we need to take to accurately run a sample uh, for a sterility test. 
Memory filtration is actually also useful for sterile tubing and devices with sterile pathways. Uh, those sterile pathways can be flushed with rinse and then the rinse filtered. And for membrane filtration sterility testing, there is a limit to how much can be put through a single filter. So several filters may be required if it is a large volume to be tested. Uh, direct inoculation. Uh, there's less variables in this test method. Uh, put simply, we aseptically transfer uh, the sample directly into growth media. Solids like uh, pellets, oils, and suspensions can also be tested this way. Direct inoculation methodology is useful for testing uh, solid objects like gauze, dressing, and medical devices. Uh, the object can be completely submerged, like a sterile gauze or a dressing, or a sterile device can either be put in whole or can be taken or cut apart so that the whole object is immersed in the growth media. All right, method suitability. The purpose of method suitability is to demonstrate that a developed sterility test method will recover organisms and allow them to flourish or proliferate uh, if present in a sample. Uh, in a moment, we'll take a look at tables two and three in USP 71 that will help us determine sample requirements and also uh, give us some indication as to what we need to do as far as a method suitability plan. Uh, traceability is important. Make sure each formulation that a pharmacy has uh, or makes is on file and connected to a formulation ID or a recipe identifier uh, so that the sample will be tested the same way each time if a passing method suitability is developed. And method suitability on a drug product should remain valid for a formulation unless either a change in the test method occurs or the formulation is changed or the volume increased. When performing method suitability, uh, all six USP 71 organisms are used as challenge organisms in the test. Membrane filtration test methodology is volume dependent, so the method suitability volume used should meet or exceed the volume that will be tested in the actual sterility test. Um, method suitability can also require significantly more volume than the actual sample test to expose the six challenge organisms to the test method. Uh, it's a good idea to validate a larger volume than currently the pharmacy makes or a potential volume because it is a volume dependent method and method suitability will have to be re repeated in the future if the test volume exceeds that's, that that's been validated. Uh, as I said previously, uh, direct inoculation is the other test method. Uh, there are fewer variables in general. Uh, the main variable that's modified in this test method is the dilution ratio, whether it be a 1 to 10, 1 to 40, or 1 to 100 method. Um, if a sample has significant antimicrobial properties, uh, the dilution can get quite high. It's a useful method for unfilterables, like suspensions and oils, and the method suitability generally requires lower sample volumes than membrane filtration, since once a viable dilution ratio is, is discovered, um, that method can be expanded for a larger test volume. At the conclusion of the method suitability test, there are two criteria to look for. Clearly visible growth after five days of incubation and a growth that is comparable to a control without a product. So as if the sample was not added, the growth needs to be as prolific uh, for that particular microorganism. If method suitability fails, then uh, the test method is to be modified either by an increased dilution, if it's a membrane filtration method, for example, uh, or a larger rinse volume. So at the end of method suitability, uh, a particular sample formulation or recipe will have a specific combination of sample volume, rinse fluid, dilution, or neutralizing agent, and some combination of those factors that will need to be used each time the, the sample is tested of that same product. All right, USP 71 sample requirements, tables two and three. All right, first we'll take a look at table two. It is the minimum quantity to be used out of a container for each media. And keep in mind there are those two medias that uh, must be inoculated with a sample for USP 71 testing to be valid. Uh, the left column there is the amount per container uh, that the container holds or that the fill volume is. On the right column is the minimum quantity to be used uh, out of each container to inoculate each media. So those volumes on the right side are 
basically doubled as far as when the actual test is conducted. Table three is the minimum number of articles to be tested in relation to the total number of articles in the batch. Uh, for pharmacies, this is the most used table since it tells them based on their batch size how many art individual articles need to be tested to qualify for USB 71 testing. On the left, we have the number of articles in the batch, uh, and that's cut up into several different groups. On the right is either a percentage or a flat number of articles that need to be tested using the USP-71 method to qualify for a valid sterility test. So both tables have to t be taken into consideration when sampling to adequately meet the requirements of the sterility test. It's generally a good idea to sample across the batch, so some from the beginning, some from the middle, and some from the end of a run to make up the number required to meet the article requirements. In the case of article requirements that uh, in the case of a calculation for article requirements um, that comes out to a decimal, always round up to the next highest whole number. And if an item contains less than two milliliters, uh, the number of articles to be tested must be doubled and uh, to meet both tables two and three requirements. And just to make sure and define it, an article is any individual uh, packaged item made during the run of a batch of a drug product. The final, the final product, whether that be a syringe or a IV bag or a vial, but it's uh, it's the final, final absolute product. We'll take a look at a few examples here, just to kind of see the uh, the calculations from the two tables in practice. The pharmacy makes a 400 article batch of a filterable perineral in 30 mil vials. The first thing the pharmacy will do is take a look at table three and see that their batch falls between the more than 100 containers but not more than 500 container uh, category. So we look to the right column, I see I need to submit 10 containers for sterility testing um, to find out how much volume will actually be tested in that sterility test. We can look at table two and see that the 30 mil vial with a 30 mil fill falls between the one to 40 mil category. So half the contents of each container uh, but not less than one mil is the category that that's under. So the full volume of 30 mils will be tested. So total test volume is the 10 vials times 30 mils gives us 300 mils total tested. We have another example here that falls into a different category from table three. A 2,000 article batch in 10 mil vials. First we'll take a look at table three and see that we're in the more than 500 containers category. So our article requirement to be tested is 2% or 20 containers, whichever is less. Do some quick math here and see that 2% 2 of 2,000 containers is 40 vials. 40 exceeds the 20 container requirement, so we'll be submitting 20 vials. In order to figure out how much volume we'll be testing, uh, since the fill volume is between 1 and 40 mils, we'll be using half the contents of each container, not less than 1 mil. Uh, so the entire contents of those 10 mil vials will be tested. So that's 10 times 20 vials submitted for 200 mils. All right, our next example here is of a decimal calculation. A pharmacy made a 780 article batch uh, in 20 mil vials. First take a look at table three. See that we fall under the more than 500 containers category. To the right, we look and see our 2% or 20 container requirement, whichever is less. 2% of 780 is 15.6, so we round up to 16. 16 is less than 20, so 16 is the required number of vials to be submitted. From table two, we can see that that falls in the 1 to 40 mil fill volume, so half the contents of each container will be tested. That's 20 mils times 16 containers gives us 320 mils total test volume. All right. This time the volume of the individual, individual articles is a bit higher than we've seen before. So we make an 800 article batch of a perennial in 50 mil vials. First we take a look at table three, see that we fall in the more than 500 containers category. 2% or 20 containers, 2% of 800 articles is 16, 16 being less than 20. We'll submit 16 on this one as well. Now when we look at table two, we're now in the greater than 40 but less than 100 mil category. So we're required to test 
put 20 mils in each media. So 40 total mils out of that 50 mil fill will be used. Therefore, 40 mils times the 16 vials we'll be testing gives a 640 mil total test volume. All right, there are a couple of interesting changes on this particular example. First of all, we're testing an antibiotic. They have their own category for the volume tested. And also, this is a 250 mil IV bag, which falls into the large volume perenteral category. So from table three, we go to our large volume perenterals. Greater than 100 mils is the, is the qualification for that. Um, if we have a 400 article batch, 2% of that is eight articles. 8 is less than 10, and notice 10 is our different number of containers versus whereas it has been 20 previously, so 8 will be submitted. We jump down to table 2 and see that for antibiotic liquids, 1 milliliter of sample needs to put it, be put into each media. So in other words, out of those 250 mil IV bags, 2 mils out of each bag is required to be pulled 1 mil into each media. So 8 articles times 2 mils means 16 milliliters will be the total test volume for this particular antibiotic. This is an example of what to do if we have a very low fill volume. From table three, we've got our 900 article batch there. Uh, that falls into the more than 500 containers. Uh, so 2% or 20 containers, whichever is less. 2% of 900 containers is 18. 18 is less than 20. So in most normal cases, we would test 18 articles. And this is where it's important for pharmacies to take a look at table two in addition to table three when coming up for article requirements for sterility testing. Since this is a less than one mil fill, I have to use the whole contents of each container into each growth media. So to meet the requirements of both tables two and three, I'm going to need to double the amount of articles I submit uh, from 18 times 2 to 36. Just to cover the volume, the way the volumes would work out there, 14.4 mils will be used in each media for 28.8 milliliters total volume tested. All right, and finally, uh, we're going to take a look at uh, subcutaneous pellets. Uh, this is a 1,400 article batch, so it's more than 500 containers. 2% or 20 containers, whichever is less. So 2% of 1,400 is 28. That is greater than 20, so normally we would submit 20. But since the pellets, depending on their, their size, can't be split up, uh, we have to double that volume to, or that number of articles to 40 so that both growth media can be inoculated with the pellets. So we'll submit 40 pellets, 20 will be put into each me media, 40 pellets total tested. All right, examination of the test media, interpretation, and subculturing of a sterility test. At intervals and at the conclusion of the 14-day sterility test, the test media will be examined visually for the evidence of microbial growth. Keep in mind, USP 71 sterility testing is a visual test, so everything is based on uh, a trained analyst being able to observe growth or not observe growth. If no evidence of growth is found, uh, the product is said to meet the requirements for the test for sterility. And a sterile result could be released from the testing lab uh, stating that it meets the requirements as set out by USP 71 sterility testing. Subcultures are something that occur during a sterility test. Uh, this generally happens in a direct inoculation test. And keeping in mind that it is a visual uh, examination of the growth media, there are drug products that will cloud, distort, settle, crystallize, or precipitate out in the growth media, making it difficult to determine whether what's being observed is growth from a microorganism or a sample effect. Uh, so if there's any doubt, a subculture is to be conducted. A small amount, one mil of the original test, is transferred to a fresh container of the same media. Both the original and the subculture uh, vessel are re-incubated at the original temperature. For an additional four days, at that point, both the original and subculture are removed from the incubator and examined for growth. Uh, if at the conclusion of that time, no growth is observed, then it can be said that the test meets the requirements for sterility. And this also explains why a subcultured sterility test requires an 18-day turnaround time. 
these are some good examples of uh, what the visual examination of a drug product that has some kind of sample effects in the media can look like. Uh, for the first example there, number one is betamethasone. Uh, you can see clearly that it clouds the media, it will settle on the bottom, uh, making it very difficult to visually determine whether what's being observed is growth from a microorganism or simply the betamethasone suspension. Uh, example two is testosterone in an oil. Uh, this example is a good example of any product in an oil. <clears throat> see it forms globules, uh, there's a thick film on the top. Uh, you get that oil and water effect when observing for growth. Uh, there are organisms out there that will grow in films similar to that. So that's why it's extremely important to subculture uh, if something like this is observed at the end of a 14-day incubation period, to be sure. Uh, example three is methylcobalamin. You can see what a very dark color red that that colors the media. Uh, the same can happen for any strongly colored drug product, like Brilliant Blue is another good example. Uh, makes it very difficult to visually look at that and be 100% certain that there's no microbial growth in that vial or vessel. So you definitely want to subculture that. Here's some additional examples. Uh, the pellets dissolve and can leave solids along the bottom of the media jar. There can also be some clouding of the media. Ointments and creams can form films or blobs in the media. So while the media itself may be clear, it's difficult, for example, in, our, in example number five, see all the blobs uh, floating there on the top, you would want to be certain that there wasn't any growth hiding in there. And finally, even clear drug products or, or drug products you wouldn't think that would cause issues have on occasion done so. The paverin will crystallize out of uh, trimix formulations, for example, depending on concentration and form crystals that will float throughout the media. There are some organisms that will form clusters that float throughout media or settle on the bottom, so a subculture would definitely be required in this case. <clears throat> All right, non-sterile test results. What happens if a test shows microbial growth? Uh, if evidence is found, put briefly, the product to examine to be examined does not meet the requirements for sterility. USP 71 does outline, however, four possible reasons to invalidate a failed sterility test. The first, the data from the environmental monitoring of the sterility testing facility or area shows a fault, indicating loss of control. Uh, the second, secondly, if a review of the test procedure used during the test reveals a fault in the method, if the growth media is found to have a failing negative control, whereby no product or organisms was added to the media, uh, but it was incubated and growth occurred, uh, there's questions as to whether the media itself started out sterile, so that is another possible reason for invalidation. And uh, if after identification of the contaminating organism in the failing sterility sample, the organism can be given direct fault to something happening in the sterility test procedure uh, and can be ascribed definitely that it occurred and was contaminated, contaminated the product test during the test procedure. If a sterility test is invalidated for one of those four reasons discussed on the previous slide, uh, USP 71 does allow a repeat of that sterility test. Uh, the requirement being that the same number of units is in the original test, so we have to re-meet the requirements of Table 2 and 3. Um, the test is conducted in the same manner as the original test, which of course should be a suitable method as determined by method suitability. After the 14 or 18 day incubation period is complete, if no evidence of microbial growth is found in the repeat test, the product examined is said to meet the test requirements for sterility. If, however, the growth is observed, after the incubation period, that product now does not meet the sterility test requirements and therefore uh, fails. All right, certificates of analysis. This is an example of an in-progress sterility test report. Uh, you'll notice there are product identifiers like a lot number or uh, and a testing lab identifier there some kind of description of the product, uh, and just additional information to make sure that the tracking of the lot tested uh, is in place. Look over to the right, you can see that uh, in the results, 
box on our report here. It shows no growth at three days. Uh, notice it does not say sterile. Um, it's just an in-progress report. We reserve that sterile report uh, for a final test result. The test method is cited as USP 71. Uh, and also looked on the left side there under analysis. It is a sterility test, but this is listed as a preliminary read, uh, so not a final result. There's also a statement on this report that says that uh, the sample requirements are followed and this test is a valid USP 71 test. Also, I know it's a little hard to see down at the bottom, but it clearly states what progress has been made on the sterility test and that this is a preliminary uh, read. <clears throat> this is a final sterility test result. Uh, notice the lot number and identifiers are still there at the top of the report. The result now says, very importantly, sterile. It's been reserved for this very last report and the laboratory should reserve the term for only that type of report. Uh, sterility is listed as the analysis and it is no longer a preliminary report. And also clearly stated there down at the bottom uh, the test conducted and that is concluded and that this is a 14-day uh, end sterility evaluation. All right, now we'll take a look at the current landscape of uh, alternative sterility test methods, most specifically rapid microbiology methods. There are primarily two technologies in use, either a cell labeling technology or a growth-based method briefly talk about what those, uh, what those involve. Uh, an example of a cell labeling method is the scan RDI system. Uh, this method has the potential to detect a single cell. Um, it can yield extremely rapid testing in as little as 90 minutes. Uh, there are some potential drawbacks to this method. Uh, it's a filterable, it's limited to filterable products. Uh, the ability of those samples tested with scan RDI or cell labeling technology to submit to investigation, depending on the viability of those cells after the sterility process, the sterility test process, process is in question. And there are some volume, testable sample volume limits to these test methods. Uh, the other test method is a growth based method. An example of this will be Celsius. Uh, they can either use ATP measurement or a headspace measurement, and that's the, the gases given off by microorganisms. Um, they do have an advantage that they can test many sample types. Uh, similar types of samples can be tested as to the compendio method. Uh, there are some potential drawbacks. Whether it's considered a drawback or not, uh, there is an incubation period of four or five days, so significantly shorter than the compendial test, but it, it's still there. <clears throat> there is some concern about slow-growing organisms being showing enough growth in that, uh, that incubation period to uh, trigger a positive test result. Um, a similar limitation to the compendial test is that uh, samples tested this way and organisms that grow under these conditions, organisms detected from this test will have to be ones that can grow under the conditions of the test. Um, there's also a chance for false positives with non-microbial ATP and there are some concerns about total testable sample volumes. Uh, the USP perspective on alternative methods or procedures for sterility testing, as I said uh, early on in the presentation, USP 1223, validation of alternative microbiological methods. Um, USP recognized that alternative methods and procedures can be used if they provide some type of advantage over a compendial test and have given, been given rigorous scrutiny as to their equivalence and uh, suitability of a testing method to meet those requirements. So they must provide an advantage and appropriate measures have to be taken to evaluate the method technically and scientifically. So that's your method suitability and equivalence being demonstrated. Uh, there's not specifics on how to do this for say a rapid method um, and requirements can also vary between state boards of pharmacy, so that would be important to check with them before deciding that a sterility method that's not compendial is uh, right for that pharmacy. An important point, the USP test methods are considered the referee tests, uh, and to briefly define referee tests, it's the method used to evaluate whether a product conforms to specifications. In this case, the specification being steril sterility. 
USB chapters below 1,000, of which 71 is included, are intended to be the referee test for any product legally marketed in the United States. Uh, an important point is if a dispute should occur for any reason, the results obtained using a USP compendio method is considered the conclusive result. And alternative methods, uh, implemented, qualified, uh, if even if validation and method suitability has been run, will not serve as a legal replacement for the official USP test method. Uh, the FDA has also given some guidance on uh, alternative methods. In CGMP 21 CFR Part 211.194, uh, it describes the general requirements for test methods utilized to assess pharmaceutical articles. It does state that regulation, in regulation that test methods have to have suitable capability regarding accuracy and reliability. So that's going to, to harp on again the method suitability and equivalence. Uh, there's also a subsection in that, uh, that document that does recognize the USP and national formulary as the, uh, the standard legal test and is the responsibility of the user to validate methods or procedures that differ from these standards in the compendia. We'll look at a brief history of the FDA's interaction with rapid methods. Uh, this first example is in February 2008. The FDA published a draft guidance on growth-based growth -based methods. Uh, so that's going to be your Celsius type systems, ATP measurement, uh, headspace, etc. An important point is that this guidance was published for cellular and gene therapy products and was not for those products regulated by the CDER, uh, which would be most of the drug products that are compounded. Um, the validation described in the draft guidance only applied to growth-based methods. In 2011, uh, the FDA amended the sterility test requirements. Uh, while this provided greater flexibility, certain requirements and specifics involved in the original document were removed, so in some ways this made it more difficult to decide what constituted a, uh, a valid sterility, alternative sterility test method. Uh, and of course, those novel methods uh, still have to have some kind of detailed validation developed. In 2000, the 2008 guidance was later with, withdrawn for these biologic products in 2015. So the FDA stance on rapid methods on drug products. Uh, Alcon Laboratories developed the first rapid method approved by the CDER of the FDA. They were using a cell labeling scan RDI system. They were later cited by the FDA for use of the rapid methodology, not specifically for the technology, but for the completeness of validations. Uh, they were conducting that test and claiming to meet the requirements of USP-71. Uh, some important points. Equivalence to USP-71 needs to be conducted for each formulation. A method suitability in a similar design to USP-71, so challenge organisms, um, suitability of the method, uh, all those things involved in a USP-71 method suitability must be conducted for each formulation that uh, is desired to be run using a rapid method. Uh, an important thing to consider on rapid sterility testing methods is the equipment involved. Uh, there's additional equipment involved that are outside of a compendial sterility test and they require their own validation and uh, certainty that their ability to deliver res accurate results is there. So that just adds another layer of complexity not found in the, the compendial sterility test. All right, in conclusion, uh, it is not well defined what constitutes a proper validation method suitability of a rapid sterility method. <clears throat> this burden is on the testing lab or pharmacy uh, to make sure that uh, they've adequately demonstrated that a method is valid, uh, suitable, and shows equivalence to the compendial method. The FDA has reviewed the sterility testing methods using rapid uh, technologies uh, as encountered on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, it's important to note that due to fundamental differences in the compendium method versus rapid methods, simply stating USP-71 as the test method is not an accurate statement. Uh, an important thing to look for on sterility testing results is uh, phrases such as USP-71 compliant and meeting the requirements of USP-71 even though USP-71 is not cited as the method. This uh, reports with these, this type of language need to be evaluated to make sure that they meet the requirement of a pharmacy's needs and those of the state board of the pharmacy as well. 
All right. Uh, this, that uh, concludes the presentation. Uh, we'll go over the objectives we've talked about. You should now be able to examine USP 71 sterility method suitability. And uh, we've taken a look at testing sample requirements. Uh, we've taken a look at the different sample types that can be tested uh, using sterility test methods and uh, how they respond to sterility testing. We've gone over uh, briefly some certificates of analysis, kind of what to look for in those cases and how to interpret what they actually say. And we've taken a look at uh, alternative sterility test methods. Uh, as I said early in the presentation, the USP routinely will publish updates to the compendia. Um, so this presentation is valid uh, for the, the current version of the USP. Uh, to make sure you, the pharmacy is using the most up-to-date information, be sure and access the current version at usp.org or www.uspnf.com. Uh, I want to thank everybody for listening to the presentation today. Uh, there's my contact information here at ARL. Uh, feel free to call or email anytime with questions. Uh, please go on and uh, evaluate the the uh, presentation today using this web link. And uh, thank you for your participation in this CE course. This is Amy Dean. Uh, we will now go to the question and answer session. Um, if you submitted questions throughout the webinar, we'll go ahead and pull those up. And then um, if you had not had an opportunity to submit questions, you can continue to submit questions on the um, question tab on your GoToWebinar toolbox. As stated previously, if we don't get to your question today, we will uh, put together a question and answer session and um, send it out to all attendees as well. All right. Uh, we'll take a second here and, and cover some questions. Uh, the first question I see up on my screen is, uh, Will fungal organisms grow in the short incubation time of three to five days? Uh, testing batches for fungi is 14 days. Uh, is 14 days enough time? Uh, Andrew? Um, some species of fungi will grow in the short incubation time of three to five. However, many are slow growers. Uh, so the full 14 days to really test is required for, uh, for various fungal organisms. That's a great answer. Um, as far as whether they'll grow in the three to five days, those example organisms uh, will grow for like the growth promotion test. Uh, those challenge organisms, those representative organisms, uh, will show growth in that in that incubation period. I was wondering if that's a reference to growth promotion. <clears throat> All right. Uh, next question here: How would you test for mold or spores? Um, being fungal organisms. Uh, they will also, spores will germinate in the growth media, in the, the soybean casein or TSB media. Um, so we'll, we will recover those, those fungal organisms in that test using uh, that growth media. Let's see. Uh, all right, we'll jump down here to another question. Can media fills be left on the pharmacy counter? temperature range, room temperature. Must media fills be incubated at a constant temperature? Um, that, uh, that question is a little bit out of USP 797, but that's all right. We'll certainly answer it. Um, yes, media fills require a constant temperature. Um, they are something that is a, a personnel qualification, so they would, they would need to be incubated uh, per 797 as far as the requirements uh, and, and duration. So there are some specifications for that that need to be followed. Andrew, do you have anything extra on that? Uh, the specific temperatures that they need to be incubated at will uh, depend on the media type. Um, however, um, I think James covered it. Yes, they do need to be kept at uh, constant temperatures. Uh, Uh, all right, if the sample is greater than one mil, why do you need to double the quantity? How is it then sampled? In the presentation, 28 mils were sampled of the 36 provided. Okay, an important clarification on the slide that we used to, to make that example. Um, the, if you notice, the fill volume was less than one mil, so that walk, that's why it was 28 mils versus 36 articles. So when added together, each article did not have one mil in it. It had less than that, so the total volume was 28 mils. 
Um, to meet the requirements of both tables two and three, um, that is the requirement is to have, use the whole contents of each container into each media. Therefore, it has to be doubled to, comp to inoculate both media uh, with the required testing volume. <clears throat> All right. How is the amount of volume to be tested for method suitability determined? If, for example, we make 150 times 10 mil vials and have a method suitability performed on, on this volume, but next time we make 250 vials, would this be covered under our first method suitability uh, based on table three? Uh, let's see. Uh, the, how is the method suitability volume calculated? Uh, depending on the membrane filtration uh, apparatus set up, there's generally two filters. Um, this is definitely something that, an explanation that might work better with an audiovisual, but I'll do my best to explain it. Uh, because there are, are six organisms tested, um, and we have to remember that the total volume we test is split between two media, and each organism has a specific media it needs to be grown in, uh, you're really doing several repetitions of the sterility test to conduct the amount of testing required to show that all six organisms will grow. So I, I hope that made sense to everybody out there. I think the simple way to put it is James had a lot of examples on his presentation about the, the volume uh, required for the sterility test or how much volume is actually being tested in the sterility test. Um, if you just, for, for simplicity, if you look at the number of articles that James had down as the requirement, if you just take that and multiply it by three, that'll give you a good idea of how much volume is going to be required for the, met for the method suitability. In this particular example of, of a, hundred, a batch of 150 vials, the requirement in the table, uh, table three for 150, is between 100 and 500, right? Um, so actually, so your example of 150 vials and 250 vials would fall into the same category on table three. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. Is that is that a 10 vial again? So that both of those cases would fall into the 10 vials required to to do the sterility test. So um, in that particular example, method suit would not need to be repeated because the volume tested um, the volume in the test is the same. <clears throat> Do you want to take the post? Sure. There's a um, there's a question on is it a requirement to potency test each batch if the BUD study is done, or can we do every other batch or whatever we decide upon? Um, and so that's. Um, sort of again up to you. So the, the potency testing on each batch um, is actually uh, separate from whether or not um, you've got a BUD study um, on, the, on your product itself. Um, so one is what they would consider to be a release test or what quality attributes do I need to evaluate for each batch um, you know, versus my labeling or, or BUD. Um, they're actually two separate things. Um, and again, that, that's sort of each pharmacy's own quality standard um, or what's directed by the State Board of Pharmacy um, would, would sort of answer that question. So that's, there's not a universal answer that, that can be given to that. Um, but I would state that their um, batch release is a different thing than um, the establishment of uh, beyond use state. All right, uh, <clears throat> we'll take a, it looks like a method suitability question here. So for method suitability testing, would the largest batch max out at the greatest number needed to run a 71 sterility test? Uh, depending on the size of the article uh, and which category it fell under, there are some cases where you could cover, or a pharmacy could cover themselves for any volume by testing the max number of articles with the largest fill possible. Um, so, so certainly, yes, you could, you could look way out there and, uh, and have a very large volume, uh, a method developed for that that would cover any potential smaller volumes. Um, and that can save, you know, time and money in the future if you're, you're already, you've already got that taken care of and out of the way. Uh, 
what is the importance of closure integrity of a container with respect to method suit? Uh, does switching container size or container type require a new method suit analysis? Uh, no. Uh, like Brian mentioned a moment ago, oftentimes uh, it, larger volumes are needed for method suitability compared to the required USP 71 volume. Um, the container size or type does not impact the need to re-perform method suitability testing. Um, however, changing container type might impact the volume needed to test, so that is something to keep in mind. Right, so if a, if a, if a container change occurred, you'd want to refer back to Table 3 um, and make sure you were still meeting those requirements, and then Table 3 would give you some insight as far as the volume required, and that would be tested for method suitability. Okay, I think that um, this is a conclusion of our question and answer session. We will um, also follow up this question and um, answer session with a document available for your review following this webinar. As a reminder, in order to receive the one contact hour, um, complete the questionnaire and evaluation, that link will also be sent out to all of the attendees following this webinar as well as a copy of the handout. Thank you for joining today's webinar and um, have a good day.